Welcome to Faith Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us. The pandemic we are in has shaken many people, but the stability of our mental attitude is solely dependent on how much we study God's Word and apply its principles. Even in trying times, we can be confident that God, in His sovereignty, has everything under His control. And that gives us enough reason to sing praises to Him with joy. being so very rich in mercy because of his great and wonderful love with which he loved us. Even when we were spiritually dead and separated from him because of our sins, he made us spiritually alive together with Christ. For by his grace, his undeserved favor and mercy, you have been saved from God's judgment. We often think so lightly of God's love, not realizing its magnitude and gravity. But I encourage everyone to intentionally listen to and think about the lyrics of the next set of songs. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. And we should be called the Son.
Good morning. This is Pastor Hoagie once again from Faith Baptist Church, South Metro. A great day to be in God's house. The last Sunday of, of August. Can you believe we only have September, October, November, and December? And the year's gone. It has gone by so quickly that it's hard to imagine how time flies. But they say that Time flies when you're having fun. I hope you're having fun with all of these things that are happening in our world. We've been studying some things in Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, that I believe are a real eye-opener as we begin to see how God has been working in the hearts and minds of people and bringing them to a place where they are calling out to him. So we're going to take our time right now, and we're going to read the passage of Scripture that we've been looking at. Then we're going to have something special that I believe will be an encouragement to you, because we're going to hear it a different way. So Exodus chapter 2, verse 23, we begin reading. So join with me as we read together. And it came to pass, in the process of time, that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. 
And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Now I'm going to ask someone to join me and help me as we read the same passage. Maybe you'll understand it a little bit better. Exodus chapter 2, versículo 23 hanggang 25. At nangyari pagkaraan ng maraming araw na ang hari sa Ehipto ay namatay. At ang mga anak ni Israel ay nagbuntong hininga dahil sa pagkaalipi. At sila ay dumaing at ang kanilang daing ay umabot sa Diyos dahil sa pagkaalipi. At dininig ng Diyos ang kanilang hibig at naalala ng Diyos ang kanyang tipan kay Abraham, kay Isaac at kay Jacob. At niningat ng Diyos ang mga anak ni Israel at sila ay kinilala ng Diyos. Thank you so much for joining with me during that reading of the passage in Tagalog. I tried to do it, but I thought it would be good to have some help. And so I asked some of our friends to join and to share with you as they read the scripture. Now, in the past, we have considered time, its concept, and the historical account of what was actually going on. We also recognize that the king died and death and its types and the effects that it has on all kinds of people in all different ways. Then we looked at suffering, and we saw that suffering continued, even though they had a new new uh, pharaoh, a new king. And we saw the principle that changing circumstances are not a guarantee of change. You see, God's rules regarding the cry of the oppressed then came up as we studied the principles of prayer as shown by God's discussion with Abram in Genesis 18. We looked at the categories of the will of God, and we saw that there was the viewpoint will of God, what does God want me to think, the operational will of God, what does he want me to do, the geographical will of God, where does he want me to go? So let's bow for prayer as we focus our attention on today's lesson. Gracious Father, thank you so much for allowing us to gather today and to be able to study from your word. I pray that you would help us and guide us as we look to your word today, and may it be a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, and an illumination to our mind as well, but more than that, may it be a stimulus to our hearts that we would be what you would have us to be, understanding who you are and how you operate. Thank you for each one who is watching and listening, and I pray your blessing upon them as we study the Word of God together. May our hearts be cleansed as we utilize the principles of 1 John 1.9. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, what I want to do this morning is go to Exodus chapter 2, verse 23, the last part where it says the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And I thought that was interesting that the word bondage is used twice. And God heard their groaning. This week, we are considering two aspects of this story. We're going to look at the word sighed, cried, and groaning. Then secondly, we're going to look at the way that bondage leads us to bring the cry to God's ears and the benefits that we have as New Testament believers. We ask you to consider, if you would please, that you are listening to the Word of God, and that you today let Him speak from the passage, and we ask that each one of us be ready to serve Him with what we then know. Let's notice the condition of the people. They sigh. In the Hebrew, this is anak. In other places, it is translated to mourn. 
It means a sigh of deep distress and sorrow, or even a breathing out of air in a show of exasperation or defeat. In Tagalog, I'll try this, nagbuntong hininga. And when I looked at the meaning of these two words, that is translated sigh in English, it means piled up breaths, excessive, or piled up exhalation as an expression of distress. Nagbuntong then the next word is they cried. This in the Hebrew is za'ak, and it means to shriek from anguish or in danger, feeling of danger. Duma'in. And to cry, da'in. To make one's feelings known in a loud and audible voice. And that's what they did. They went from sighing to crying, to shrieking, to saying, God, why is this? What is going on? How come? The third, they groaned. Nihaka. In Hebrew, Nihaka, it just means to simply groan. You say, what's the difference between a sigh and a groan? Well, in Tagalog, the translation was what? Habik, or hibik, I'm sorry. Hibik, it means to sob or to cry with deep cries. The Hebrew might limit the expression to that of a groan because of the length of time and the deep sorrow that had been felt by the people. But a groan as compared to a sigh, let's see if I can kind of explain it. A sigh goes like this. That's a sigh. And they sighed. That means they continued to go. And their sighs piled up, it says in the Tagalog. Their heavy breathing piled up. But when you get past the shrieking and the crying, then you come to the groaning. And this is where there is now a loss of energy. And you can't cry anymore. You can't shriek anymore. All you do is moan or groan like that. Uh, uh, uh. It's clearly, whatever the case, it's, it's a description of a people who are individually and collectively at the very place of despair. These three words would lead us back to the cause of the national and mental and spiritual state that they're in. It will lead us to understand the awful condition that the people were experiencing. It was awful. It was terrible to be in bondage. And that's what we're going to look at, the, the, the circumstances of their plight. What was their plight? They were in bondage. Now, in the Hebrew, Abodal, I looked up the passage in a companion where it says, here's the English and here's the Hebrew, Abu Dao. But when you see the word, it's the word for work, but it is double. You see, the root word is Abad or Abad, but the word bondage is Abu Dao, Abu Dao, meaning to work or to be an employee, but now for it to be bondage. Here the word is doubled, indicating the severity of the work and its control of the life of the individual. And I got to thinking, it's, 
It's much like what is done in other places in the Bible. Maybe you remember, much like die, die in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, God warns against disobedience's consequences. Ye shall surely die. In the Hebrew, it's die, die. You will die twice. You will work twice. You'll work twice as hard. Here, the effect of the fall is clearly seen in Genesis. Adam was made a workman in the bondage sense of the word. When after the fall, God relegated him to become a slave to the labor of the ground. Genesis 3.17 says, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Prior to the time of cursing, you see, the earth was bringing forth abundantly, as indicated by the observation. The fact that there was great abundance without man's need to till the ground. Look at Genesis 2, verse 5 and 6. There was no one to till the ground. God sent the dew enough to cause it to sprout and grow in abundance. But the fall caused mankind to become not only a slave and in bondage to the earth, but the fall caused man to become the bondman of death. Or, in other words, he became a slave to the sinful nature, that death which now lives within each one of us. We are a slave to death that lives in us. You see, within the body of every man, woman, boy, and girl is death. Not only in the spiritual nature, but it's appointed unto man once to die. Everyone is going to die. The Bible portrays slavery as a shadow of all people's horrible slavery to sin. It says we become Christ's slaves when we become Christians in Romans chapter 6 and verse 18. But this actually means we gain our freedom because sin no longer controls us. It goes like this in 6.16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Ye were the servants of sin, let me emphasize. But he says, ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Verse 18, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So people today are slaves to sin until they commit their life to Christ, who alone can conquer sin's power. Sin, pride, fear no longer have any claim over us. Just as a slave owner no longer has power over the slaves that someone buys from him. And we were bought with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that slavery was common throughout the Roman Empire. Some Christians in the Corinthian church were undoubtedly saved, slaves. Paul said that although the Christian slaves were slaves to other human beings, they were free from the power of sin in their lives. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 22 and 23. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. In other words, he's saying, don't be careful about it. Don't be mindful about it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant or a slave is the Lord's free man. Likewise, he that is called being free is Christ's slave or servant. Friends, human slavery has been practiced in history. It was actually undermined by the freedom given through Christ. Aren't you thankful that we, no matter what our station in life is, we're free? 
Paul does not condone or condemn slavery. But he does something else. What is that? He explains that Christ transcends all divisions between people, socially, racially, if you please, uh, economically, even sexually. There's no difference. We are all in need of being with Christ, and in Christ, we are free from those things while we are slaves to him. Slaves are told to work hard as though their master were Christ himself. That's found in Colossians chapter 2, verses 22 through 25. Listen, servants, obey in all things your master supporting to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. <laughs> we like to do, uh, quote that whenever it's time to eat, uh, eat heartily. But he was talking about work, service. Do it heartily as unto the Lord, knowing, verse 24, that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. Is that our mentality today? Verse 25, he has a word but there, and it's important that we see it. But he that doth wrong shall receive for the wrong he hath done, and there's no respect of persons with God. Now, that's the advice to servants. But masters were also told to be just and fair. It appears that mankind will, after the fall, now always be a slave to someone or something. The Bible, the scriptures that we have already read, tell us that we become Christ's slaves when we become believers in Jesus Christ. This actually means we gain our freedom because sin no longer controls us. Now, from how Paul describes the hard time he had, he had, he saved, he's delivered, but the battle is on for us. Satan doesn't give up. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 7, verse 19 and following. Get your Bible and go there. Romans 7, verse 19 through 25. He says, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He recognizes that he doesn't want to do it, but there's a sin nature that is in him that grabs him and tries to lead him. I find in the law, verse 21, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. I want to do that which is right, but there's something inside that leads me wrong. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Then one of the I would say, uh, most heart-wrenching verses in the Bible. It's a cry from the heart. It's almost like the cry of the children of Israel. Oh, wretched man that I am, who deliver me from the body of this death? Then he answers, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with flesh, the law of sin. My mind is important that I keep it straight. Paul says that only through Jesus Christ can we be free from the control of the old sin nature. And this will mean that we, like Paul, 
may have to come to the point where we cry out as he did, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Well, we saw those terrible words. We saw the fact that God heard. Now we notice God hears their groaning. The change in God's response. While we have considered prayer in a previous study, here we find that something caused a real change in the response. By reason of the bondage, it says. Again, by reason of the bondage. The word bondage is used twice. It appears that the severity of the bondage and the intensity of the cry cause a different response in God. It's apparent that God, because of his omniscience, knew what was going on. But something caused a different response. And it's here that we must harmonize the plan of God with God's time. There had been a time limit set. For what reason, we do not know on the length of days that they would suffer. God foretold that they would be in bondage. The prophetic word of God to Abram in Genesis 15 clearly sets forth in verse 13, 400 years. They will serve them 400 years. Now we can have a clue from another part of that prophecy in verse 16 something interesting but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again for the iniquity of the amorites is not yet full so we need a little history lesson here <clears throat> the amorites who are they the first mention of the amorites in the bible is in genesis chapter 10 verse 15 and 16 the Amorites were the direct descendants of Canaan, the son of Ham, Genesis 10, 6, the son of Noah. There is nothing negative mentioned about the Amorites. In fact, they were Abram's allies in Genesis 14 when he went to rescue Lot and the people of Sodom for the, from the kings of Kedarlaom. The first lengthy description of the iniquity of the Amorites, however, is found in Numbers. This is after the Exodus. In chapter 21, 21 verse 21 through 26, it's a recounting of the Exodus from Egypt. And it talks about Sihon, S-I-H-O-N, king of the Amorites, that he would not allow Israel to pass through his territory on the king's highway. All they asked was, let us go by. We won't attack you. Let us go by. Instead, he attacked them. Another thing is the people's worship practice. And God warned them because it was entwined with sexual activity and the sacrificing of their own children to the god Molech. Read Leviticus 20, 1 through 5. Now it says, until the iniquity of the Amorites is full or complete. This is found back there in Genesis 15, verses 13 through 21, when God talks to Abram and says, they're going to be slaves 400 years until the iniquity of the Amorites is full or complete. This most likely, most likely is something like what is sufficient to merit national judgment by God. Such an explanation also incorporates the view that God is incredibly forbearing forgiving as the Lord is long-suffering toward us, not willing 
that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance in 2 Peter 3, 9. So the passage is a wonderful reminder to us of several things. Let's notice. One, God is just, and he will harmonize all of history with his justice and his love. God's sovereignty, number two, takes all elements into consideration and will ultimately give every person and national identity the ability to stand before him, the responsibility for him to stand before him in judgment. So, friend, we can trust God to bring the events of our world to righteous justice, even though it may be a while of coming. And then the most important thing is that we keep our focus on him and continue to cry out in our bondage as sinners, like Paul did, or as a people, like Nehemiah did. Calling on God as a people and asking for forgiveness. Let's have a few thoughts on the sovereignty of God. The principle is this. God is sovereign, controls governments and laws according to his plan and his time. God directly controls the action of mankind according to Exodus chapter 11, verse 6 and 7. God tells Moses to be ready the night before they're going out. And he says this, there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. If we look at this, and simply say and claim that we are Israel and Egyptians or our slaveholders cannot do anything to us, we have to look at history. And history has shown that many, many believers paid the price of martyrdom. So this is not like the Egyptians. In Philippians chapter 2, And verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So God is working not just in the circumstances. God is also working in us as well. Exodus 12, verse 35 and 36 of the children of Israel, it says, did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they, what? Spoiled the Egyptians. They carried out tons of gold out of them when they left. God did this so that they would be repaid for the work that they had done for 400 years. Please remember this truth. No one can slow or hinder the plan of God. No one can slow or hinder the plan of God. Men have tried. God's plan cannot be. Psalm 2, verses 2 through 4. Go there, if you would, please. Psalm 2, verses 2 through 4. The kings of the earth set themselves, and rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. And I know the events that have just taken place in Afghanistan and what may be going to happen in the future will cause many Christians to scratch their head and say, what is going on? This verse says, God will have them in derision. But remember, God's timing was 400 years. His timing for the children of Israel was 400 years. I'm not saying we're going to have 
400 years of slavery and everything today before the Lord returns? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we must be mindful that God controls men. And God controls the animal kingdom. Mark 14, 30, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say to thee, that this day, even in this night, Peter, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me Christ. There's no such thing as luck. God controls all actions. Oh, if I'm lucky, I'll win the, the lottery. No. Oh, if I'm lucky, I'll, I'll not get COVID. No. God controls all actions. He is in control of everything. He sees everything that goes on, and he, in his sovereign will, has settled everything. all according to the good pleasure of his will. Proverbs 16, 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is the Lord. Oh, it's luck. Really? 1 Kings 22, 28. And Micaiah said, this is a, a, a prophet. Micaiah said, if thou return at all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, hearken, O people, every one of you. In other words, God reveals his will, and God controls nature, just as he controls nature. Job 36, verse 32 and 33. With clouds he covereth the light, and commandeth it not to shine by the cloud that cometh with it. The noise thereof showeth concerning it. The cattle also concerning the vapor. It reads a little clear like this. He covers his hands with the lightning and commands it to strike the mark. The time of our death is not enough. The time of our death is appointed by God. Job 14, verse 5 and 6. Seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. Turn from him that he may rest till he shall accomplish as entirely his day. God says, this is your life. You're going to live. And when you die, it's not an accident. And people were saying, oh, they died in an accident. No, they didn't die. Hebrews 9, 27. It's appointed unto man once to die after this. Remember, God exercises control over the human heart, overriding human free will when it is for our own good. In Acts chapter 16, we find the story of Lydia. A certain woman, it says in verse 14, a woman named Lydia, seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, Luke wrote, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken. God opened her heart. And finally, Jesus says in John 6, verse 37 and 44, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. I'll raise him up the last day. So, Romans 9, verse 16 and 17. So then it's not of him that will, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hearten. What a, what a compilation of truths and principles regarding the sovereignty of God in the affairs of men. 
But I want to close with a study from a short passage in the New Testament that defines prayer, its benefits, which come to us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior as we study the Scriptures. We have great benefits as people of God in the New Testament. We have been given the Holy Spirit, not only to seal us in this relationship with God, but it also gives a believer knowledge that the Comforter acts on our behalf. He not only comforts us, he takes. He takes our yearning. He lives within. He becomes our translator toward God when we cannot elocute or express our heart's desire. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8. God gives us great insight and hope in this passage. And he teaches us. He says this. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we are. But the Spirit himself make an intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. There's that word again, groaning. If we groan toward God, he's the amplification. We can't even express the words. All we say is, oh, oh. He searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he, he makes intercession. It says he makes intercession for us, for the saints, those who know Jesus Christ, according to the will of God. You see, Paul continues there. He says, we know that all things work together for good that, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. What a transitionary passage. And the Holy Spirit, who helps us understand the word of God when we're spirit-filled, also translates for us toward God. Those groanings, those feelings that cannot be uttered. We have the greatest consolation in knowing that while we are yet speaking, he's taking our petitions. While we're yet groaning, he's taking our desires to the Father. It's all part of the plan of God, working his good pleasure in us and through us. It's, it's beyond my imagination how people in our modern world are so caught up today in correcting a wrong African slave that, proceed, that, that happened 200 years ago. All the while, they're committed to the killing of babies in the womb today. I don't understand. But then I understand the human heart. So don't forget. God doesn't forget these things. God held Israel in bondage until his grace ran out for the people known as the Amorites. And today, I am told, there are no longer any people known as Amorites. They have been removed from the landscape of human existence. Yet God extends mercy, and he's not willing that any should perish. And so this is your opportunity, if you have not yet accepted Jesus Christ, to accept the message of salvation, not in religion, not in good works, but in Christ. Why? Because he died on the cross. He paid the penalty, and he rose from the grave. He is our Savior. Let's accept him as such. This is an opportunity than for believers to be filled with the Spirit of God and study God's Word, applying its principles in their lives and sharing the message of hope to a lost and dying world. And that message is simply this. 
Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the truths that are found in it. And thank you for the deliverance that you provide. Lord, as we continue the study next week, may our hearts be thrilled and see what caused this change. I pray, Father, that every one of us would rejoice in what Christ has done for us that we would be partakers of the great, great privileges that are ours, the inheritance that we've received. And may we live victorious, even in trying times, in hard times. May people around us know that we are people that trust God in Jesus' name. Well, folks, you might have heard, Ms. Ogie and I have uh, been suffering the last two weeks with uh, COVID, but I'm telling you, I'm strong enough to stand and preach to you today, and God has been good. We are under medication, we're under the supervision of good doctors, and under the prayers of God's people, and there is not death. In COVID. She told me a typhoid. She had, uh, uh, in fact, she had typhoid twice in the Philippines. Her, her grandfather died of typhoid here in the United States many, many, many years ago. But you know what, folks? Above all, God wants us to live as though we trust Him in life or in death. God is in control. We grieve for those who have lost loved ones. But I pointed out to many people, we've lost people in our church, not of COVID, heart attack, tuberculosis. I trust that each one of us will have a testimony of God that we trust Him and we believe. He's still on the throne. I'm going to continue next Sunday. It's going to be exciting. I hope you'll be with us. Brother Camacho will be here in just a moment. And Brother Matt on Wednesday night. So the Bautista bringing good lessons at 6.30. Then there are Bible studies for ladies and for men. And if you're interested, you'll find announcements for that. Just follow it. Thank you again for watching today. I trust that you will find great hope and help in your life from the fact that God is the deliverer from bondage, the bondage of fear, the bondage of sin. One day, they from the presence of sin. Thank you for watching.